Chapter 9 The Scriptural Idea of Health and Disease Everywhere in the Jewish and Christian scriptures our relation to God is represented as a vital one. This idea was not pushed to such prominence in the Greek philosophy, but is one which the science of the present age tends to demonstrate. That there is a God is a necessity of thought, for we cannot conceive of the finite without at the same time having the idea of the infinite. Time limited leads to the conception of unlimited time, or endless duration. Space bounded and definite suggests the thought of boundless space or immensity. The same is true of wisdom, goodness, and power. Thus, as Cousin, the French metaphysician, shows, the finite necessarily leads to the conception of the infinite. Thus, the prevalence of theoretical atheism to any great extent will be an impossibility. The existence of God is a necessary truth and a fundamental verity of the intuitive reason. But the fundamental idea of Christianity as a system of religious philosophy, and one that distinguishes it from all other religions of the world, is the prominence it gives to the consciousness of God within, the incarnation of God in man, the indwelling of the deity in the inmost depths of the human soul. But lie does not reside there as an inoperative principle, or as a metaphysical idea, but as the hidden spring of our life, the very ground of our existence, so that without this connection of our souls with him, our own existence, since it is not eternal and self-derived, and all our activity of body and mind, would be an impossibility. Paul L., as the representative of Christianity, affirms before the Supreme Court of the Athenian Republic that in him we live, and move, and have our being, and that it is he who giveth life, and breath, and all things J. And he quotes the poet Aratus to show that this is a truth recognized by the religious consciousness of the world. For we are all his offspring. We are children of God, that is, our existence is derived or springs from His, and is continued or perpetuated by our filial relation to Him. This must have sounded strange to those who looked for God in something without, and not in the depths of their own being. In the city of Athens there were thirty thousand idols, and, as one has said, it was easier to find a God than a man, but it was only an intensifying of the tendency to externalize the deity, which we see even at the present time. The doctrine of Paul I was drawn from the Jewish scriptures, or, at least, is in perfect harmony with their teaching. In one of the Psalms of David there is a passage equally explicit as that of the utterance of Paul L. before the Areopagus, with thee is the fountain of life, and thy light shall we see light. Here our life is viewed as a stream that issues from the inexhaustible fount of being, and consequently having no independent existence of its own. Under a clear apprehension of the intuitive truth that life, and consequently health, which is only a mode of life, are from the primal source of being, the inspired Hebrew poet prays that God's saving health and expression full of meaning might be known among all nations. Under the influence of an influx of life and light from the world above, the psalmist was raised out of the plane of Jewish selfishness and exclusiveness, and prays that an emanation of the divine life, as an efficient spiritual remedy for all disturbed conditions of mind and body, should become universally known. The moment a man comes into a sympathetic conjunction with God he feels as God docks and is actuated by an irrepressible desire to impart all possible good to others. David, in one of his psalms, says of the man who considers the poor, that is, of one who is of use in the world as an organ of expressing the divine love, that the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing, and will make, or, according to the marginal and more literal rendering, will turn all his bed in his sickness, and will not deliver him over to his enemies or those spiritual influences that cause the disease. In the Jewish religious consciousness the idea that life and health were from God seems to have been deeply rooted. This was often expressed in the prophetic state, or when the mind was under the influence of a divine afflatus. Jeremiah prays, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. In this passage we see the parallelism between the words save and heal, which are identical in meaning. In that age of simple, childlike faith medical science had taught mankind no better way for the cure of disease than to apply directly to the source of all life for relief. It might have been as well for the world in this respect if it had remained in that stage of blissful and healthful ignorance. The trade in drugs would have been less, and the public health unproved thereby. All genuine poetry is an inspiration, and its tendency is to bring the soul nearer to God. It gives prominence to that which is ideal and divine. There is a marked likeness in the spirit of the hymns of the Vedas and the Psalms of David. Both give reality to the divine influence in human life. There is a very beautiful passage in the Hebrew sacred poetry expressive of the relation of the divine life to the cure of all mental and bodily maladies. Bless the Lord, 
zero my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed as the eagles, no comment on this could add to its force or beauty. It expresses one of the profoundest practical truths in the universe, the life of God in human nature. So fully convinced was the great religious poet of the Hebrews that the Lord was the source and the strength of our life that he believed he could save us from the most fatal epidemics, from the pestilence that walketh in darkness, and from the destruction that watch at noonday. When the ocean tide flows hack and takes possession of a river, it gives to the stream the qualities of the ocean. So when a man attains to the consciousness of the immanence of God in his individual being, and that is, life is hid with Christ in God, he is an incarnation of the deity, a divine theophany, a manifestation of God in the flesh. He is a partaker of the divine nature, and thus is strengthened with might in the inner man. The idea of the indwelling of God in man as the source of life and health, which was so deeply rooted in the religious consciousness of the pious Jews, was carried over into Christianity and received there a more philosophical expression. The whole life of Jesus the Christ was the highest exemplification of the power of this idea ever witnessed in the history of the race, in a demonstration of its theoretical and practical truth. He cured diseases of mind and body by bringing men into conscious contact with the one and only life. Thus we see that the higher forms of the religious life, in the state of mind and body which we designate by the name of health, are closely associated. The radical significance of the word religion is that of reunion, or a binding together of what has been sundered. When realized in its full import, it unites the body to the soul in a living correspondence and consciously connects the soul with God in an influential sympathetic union. In this state of conjunction with the Lord of life and the Father of spirits, the boundary line between our individual existence and the divine being becomes more dimly defined, and each soul becomes in a degree a repetition of the Christ in another personality, and the answer of the prayer of Jesus is fulfilled that we might become one with God as lie, and the Father were one. In this state we lay hold of eternal life, death is annihilate, and disease loses its reality. Our life is so linked with the divine being that because he lives we live also. The divine incarnation thus becomes, in a proper sense, a universal and continuous fact, for it is this alone that makes man a spiritual being, and kindles in the depths of his individual being the unquenchable spark of immortality. We are thus made into the image of God, or are finite copies of the divine life. No one has life in himself, self-originated and underived, but it is the perpetual gift of God. It is also intuitively certain that the same is true of health. Vital force in its last analysis is the life of God and man, and every man can say, in the language of David, that the Lord is the health of his countenance.